I love the touch the movie adds, showing everyone excitedly cheering Harry and Cedric, only for the truth to gradually hit each of them. Amos Diggory's reaction is particularly heartbreaking. Jeff Rawl absolutely kills it here. That's my son! This is my boy! This is my boy! So Harry immediately tells Dumbledore that Voldemort's back. This is huge, because Voldemort didn't want anyone to know he'd returned, especially Albus Dumbledore. Harry was supposed to die in that graveyard. Unfortunately, this is a moment where I feel like Daniel Radcliffe's acting is a little forced. He's back! He's back! Voldemort's back! Cedric, he asked me to bring his body back. I couldn't leave him. Not that. Oh, and one more thing. In the movie, we can see Karkaroff standing here, but in the book, we learn that he actually fled when he felt his dark mark burn. After all the Death Eaters he betrayed, he knows they would likely kill him on sight if he returned, so now he's on the run. So Moody takes Harry away from the scene and into his office. Now, in the book, it's explained that this is what tipped Dumbledore off that it was an imposter because the real Moody never would have let Harry out of Dumbledore's sight after all of that. We see Moody acting somewhat differently than usual, as he seems very interested in the details of what happened in the graveyard. Now that the plan has been completed, Barty Crouch Jr. doesn't feel the need to keep up the Moody persona as much. In the book, he flat out confesses to being the Death Eater who delivered Harry to Voldemort, but I do kind of like in the movie how Harry catches on to the fact that he knows far more than he should. Were there others? In the graveyard, were there others? Uh, um, the... I... I don't think I said anything about a graveyard, Professor. In the book, Moody questions Harry about whether Voldemort forgave or punished the Death Eaters who didn't go to Azkaban for him, and seems to take insane delight in the prospect that he might have hurt them. However, Harry is in too much of a state of disbelief to answer him. Moody then goes into detail about how he guided Harry through the tournament as well as scared off everyone who tried to hurt him. He talked Hagrid into showing Harry the dragons, told Harry how to beat the dragon, told Cedric how to solve the egg riddle, knowing his sense of honor would lead him to tell Harry, gave Neville the book with information on Gillyweed, when that didn't work he called Dobby to the staff room to pick up robes for cleaning and loudly wondered whether Harry would think to use Gillyweed and of course, dealt with the obstacles and the other champions in the maze. Honestly, this whole reveal blew my mind when I first read it. Much like Harry, I was completely shocked. I never suspected that Moody was the bad guy. So Moody prepares to kill Harry, reveling in the praise his master will likely heap upon him when he does so. And there's a line from the book here that I think really reflects the root of his character. I will be honored beyond all other Death Eaters. I will be his dearest, his closest supporter, closer than a son. All Barty Crouch Jr. wanted was a father figure in his life, and unfortunately, he found the absolute worst one he possibly could. So Dumbledore manages to arrive in time to save Harry by blasting the door down and hitting Moody with a stunning spell, not Expelliarmus like he does in the movie, and which again is not a stunning spell. Now this is one of my favorite parts of the books because of the description of Dumbledore here. At that moment, Harry fully understood for the first time why people said Dumbledore was the only wizard Voldemort had ever feared. The look upon Dumbledore's face as he stared down upon the unconscious form of Mad-Eye Moody was more terrible than Harry could have ever imagined. There was no benign smile upon Dumbledore's face. No twinkle in the eyes behind the spectacles. There was cold fury in every line of the ancient face. It would have been amazing to get the same feeling in the film at this moment. Unfortunately, Dumbledore kind of came across as angry and threatening all throughout the movie, so... Yeah, it didn't work. In the movie, Snape already has the Veritas Serum with him, and Dumbledore has him feed it to Moody right away, who reveals under its influence that he's not really Moody, and that the real Moody is in his trunk. The three of them open the trunk, find Moody, and Snape reveals there was Polyjuice Potion in his hip flask. 
By the way, I love this little smirk on Harry's face, as if to say, believe me now, you greasy-haired bastard. In the book, Moody was knocked unconscious by Dumbledore's spell, and Dumbledore sends Snape to go get the Veritas Serum and to bring Winky up here. Seems like he's already figured out who this is. He also tells McGonagall that there's a big black dog in the pumpkin patch by Hagrid's hut, and tells her to bring it up to his office, then come back here. After they've left, Dumbledore opens the trunk. In the book, it actually has seven locks, and each one reveals different contents, with the final one being the real Moody. Dumbledore then reveals the Polyjuice Potion to Harry, and they wait for the imposter to change back. The revelation of who it really is is good in both versions, but again, far more shocking in the book because we didn't know Barty Crouch Jr. was even alive or if he really was a Death Eater until now. So in the book, Snape and McGonagall return with Winky and Dumbledore feeds the Veritas Serum to the still unconscious Barty Crouch Jr. Incidentally, the images in the faux glass have actually formed into the shapes of Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Snape at this point. Now, Crouch Jr.'s demeanor here is very different in the movie than in the book. In the movie, he still seems to be trying to fight back and escape, whereas in the book, I assume due to the effects of the Veritas Serum, he seems a little out of it. He even talks about Dumbledore in third person, even though he's speaking directly to him. Also, I'm not sure what this is all about. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Your arm hurts. Uh -huh. Why does he want to see Harry's bleeding arm so badly, especially since he's already seen it? Furthermore, why does Dumbledore oblige him? Yeah, this part wasn't in the book. In the book, Crouch Jr. at Dumbledore's request and under the influence of the Veritas Serum tells his whole story, which I already basically went through over the course of this video. His mother smuggled him out of Azkaban by taking on his appearance. His father used the Imperius curse on him to keep him imprisoned at home. Bertha Jorkins discovered him and his father accidentally damaged her memory trying to make her forget. At the Quidditch World Cup, he conjured the Dark Mark using Harry's stolen wand. Voldemort came for him, put his father under the Imperius curse and freed him. He and Wormtail captured Moody and he took on his form to enter Harry into the Triwizard Tournament and guide him through it. He also reveals here, much to Winky's horror, that he killed his father to stop him from telling Dumbledore everything. So after his confession, Dumbledore orders McGonagall to guard him, not Snape like in the movie. He tells Snape to bring Cornelius Fudge up here since he'll want to question Crouch himself. Dumbledore then brings Harry to his office. Before I get to that though, there is one thing the movie doesn't explain at all. The fate of Barty Crouch Jr., we hear Dumbledore say he's going back to Azkaban, but we never see him again in the movies, even after all the other Death Eaters escape. The reason for this is because in the book, Barty Crouch Jr. never makes it to Azkaban. As we learn from McGonagall and Snape, when Fudge came to question Crouch, he brought a Dementor with him for protection, and as soon as it saw Crouch, it immediately performed the Dementor's kiss on him, sucking out his soul. So, yeah, he's worse than dead. Because they never revealed what had happened to him in the movie, I remember before the casting news for Order of the Phoenix came out, I actually wondered for a little while if they were going to have him take over Bellatrix's role in the movies. I think it would have made sense, and it would have been cool to see more of David Tennant. That said, Helena Bonham Carter was one of the best parts of the later movies, so I'm definitely not upset they didn't do that. Still, it does seem like a bit of a waste to get a great actor like David Tennant and have him play such a small role in only one of the movies. Also, leaving his fate open-ended like that is just weird. So anyway, Dumbledore brings Harry to his office, where Sirius is waiting for them. Dumbledore asks Harry to tell him everything that happened in the graveyard, and when Harry is clearly reluctant to relive it, Dumbledore says... If I thought I could help you by putting you into an enchanted sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what has happened tonight, I would do it. But I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell us what happened. So Harry tells Dumbledore and Sirius everything that happened. When he gets to the part about Voldemort reviving and seemingly surpassing his mother's protection by taking Harry's blood, Dumbledore has a very interesting reaction. 
For a fleeting instant, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. I remember there were so many theories about this. People were wondering about it all the way until Deathly Hallows, and sure enough, in that book, this plot point came back. Voldemort having Lily's blood meant he couldn't kill Harry. Again, Rowling really planned all this out. That wasn't just an out-of-nowhere deus ex machina that saved Harry and Deathly Hallows. When Harry talks about his and Voldemort's wands connecting, Dumbledore explains priori incantatum to him, which I've already explained. He also reveals that Fox was in fact the phoenix who gave his feathers to both Harry and Voldemort's wand, something the movies never revealed at all. Not that it's all that important. There is an abbreviated version of this scene in the movie, a little later in the Gryffindor dormitory rather than Dumbledore's office, but it doesn't really explain much. Harry does mention the wands connecting, and Dumbledore says, Priori incantatum. Well, that explained everything. Thanks, Dumbledore. That said, I do like this brief story Dumbledore tells. I never liked these curtains. Set them on fire in my fourth year. <laughs> By accident, of course. As much as I've criticized the portrayal of Dumbledore in this movie, that is legit something I could see book Dumbledore saying. I'm also glad they included one of my favorite Dumbledore lines from the book, though he says it during his eulogy for Cedric there. Soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. So after all that, Dumbledore brings Harry to the hospital wing, followed by Sirius in dog form. Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione are there, but Dumbledore asks them to let Harry sleep and not to question him yet. Unfortunately, he doesn't sleep for long as he is woken up by an argument. Now, this is a very important scene that I wish hadn't been cut from the movie. It's where we see Cornelius Fudge flat out deny that Voldemort could possibly have returned, primarily because he doesn't know what he'll do if he does. Fudge has never been a strong leader. He got into office on a technicality because more qualified people either refused the position or fell into disgrace. And he's only ever been minister during times of relative peace. It's far easier to appear a good leader when there's no conflict. And now that real conflict has presented itself to him, he shows his true colors, as he does everything in his power to deny and avoid dealing with it. In other words, he chooses what is easy over what is right. Even Harry is shocked by his attitude. Harry couldn't believe what he was hearing. He had always thought of Fudge as a kindly figure. A little blustering, a little pompous, but essentially good-natured. But now, a short, angry wizard stood before him, refusing point-blank to accept the prospect of disruption in his peaceful and ordered world. The argument starts with McGonagall screaming at Fudge for bringing a Dementor with him when he went to interrogate Crouch Jr., and as I mentioned before, we learn that Crouch Jr. had his soul sucked out. Fudge attempts to pass off the blame by saying that Jr. was a raving lunatic and couldn't have given them any useful information anyway. Dumbledore then tries to tell Fudge about Voldemort's return, but as I mentioned, he refuses to believe it, discrediting Harry's account of things by referencing Rita Skeeter's article about him being crazy. Harry names the Death Eaters he saw, but Fudge dismisses this as well, saying that Lucius Malfoy has been donating to excellent causes. He also refuses Dumbledore's suggestions that he send envoys to the Giants before Voldemort can and remove the Dementors from Azkaban. Seeing as they would join Voldemort in a heartbeat, it's not wise to leave them in charge of guarding his followers. Dumbledore calls Fudge out on caring more about his career than doing the right thing, and the importance he places on blood purity. You place too much importance, and you always have done, on the so-called purity of blood. You fail to recognize that it matters not what someone is born, but what they grow to be. Your Dementor has just destroyed the last remaining member of a pure-blood family as old as any, and see what that man chose to make of his life. Even Snape has a cool moment where he shows Fudge the dark mark on his forearm as proof that Voldemort has returned. Dumbledore gives Fudge an ultimatum, essentially. Take the steps I have suggested, and you will be remembered, in office or out, as one of the bravest and greatest ministers for magic we have ever known. Fail to act, and history will remember you as the man who stepped aside and allowed Voldemort a second chance to destroy the world we have tried to rebuild. 
Sadly, it's the latter that will end up happening. After Fudge leaves, stopping only to give Harry his 10,000 galleons for winning the tournament, Dumbledore immediately gets to work. He sends Bill to talk to his father about reaching out to people in the ministry they can get to believe them. He sends McGonagall to bring Hagrid and Madame Maxime to his office, Envoys to the Giant, as we'll learn in the next book, and finally he has Sirius resume his human form. After making him and Snape shake hands, which they do very reluctantly, he gives each of them a mission. He tells Sirius to contact what he calls the Old Crowd. This, of course, is the Order of the Phoenix. He tells Snape simply, Severus, you know what I must ask you to do, if you are ready. As we later learn, he's sending Snape back to spy on Voldemort. Between all of this and the stuff with Fudge, this scene sets up the next book so well, and it really is a shame the movie didn't include any of it. It would have helped things flow so much more naturally. Following all of this, we see the guilt Harry is feeling over Cedric's death hit him like a ton of bricks. If he had just taken the cup, Cedric would still be alive. Fortunately, neither of Cedric's parents blame him. Rather, they both thank him for bringing their son's body back. Harry offers to give them his Triwizard winnings, but they refuse. We see the trio visit Hagrid, who talks about how he always knew Voldemort was going to come back, and that they should be fine as long as they've got Dumbledore. They try to get him to tell them what Dumbledore wanted him and Madame Maxime to do, but he doesn't tell. We then see the end of year feast, during which Dumbledore gives his eulogy for Cedric, something the movie did show, and I think did very well. Cedric Diggory was, as you all know, Exceptionally hardworking, infinitely fair minded, and most importantly, a fierce, fierce friend. Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. The Ministry of Magic does not wish me to tell you this, but not to do so, I think, would be an insult to his memory. But while we may come from different places and speak in different tongues, our hearts beat as one. Remember that. And Cedric Diggory will not have died in vain. It's not exactly the same as in the book, but I don't mind that. It gets across the same message, and Michael Gambon plays it very well. There's only one part I do wish had been kept in. Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. But overall, I love this scene. Following this, we see the Hogwarts students say goodbye to the students from Bobaton and Durmstrang. I really like these shots in the movie of the students from different schools hugging and saying goodbye to each other. The trio also have a moment in the movie that I really like. I think we'll ever just have a quiet year at Hogwarts. <laughs> no, but I don't think so. In the book, Fleur says goodbye to Harry, whereas in the movie, we only see her say goodbye to Ron. We see Crumb say goodbye to Hermione in both versions, but the book also shows him talking to Harry about how much he liked and respected Cedric. We also see Ron overcoming his jealousy demons to ask for an autograph from Crumb, which he signs. The movie ends after this, and honestly, it's a pretty good spot to end. The book, however, has a couple more things that happen, but it's all pretty cuttable, especially given the storylines they already cut from the movie. The book then cuts to the Hogwarts Express, heading back to King's Cross. A couple things happen on the journey. First of all, Hermione reveals to Harry and Ron that she figured out how Rita Skeeter was getting all her information, and reveals a beetle she caught in a jar, none other than Rita herself. And since Rita was never registered as an Animagus, this is technically illegal. She says she'll let Rita out when they get off, but she made her promise not to write any articles for a year or she'll spill her secret to the world. Following that, Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle arrive, with Malfoy warning them that mudbloods and muggle lovers will be the first to go now that the Dark Lord is back, and making light of Cedric's death. The trio, along with Fred and George, who come to join them, blast the three with a bunch of spells that combine to turn them into hideous abominations. Joining them in their compartment, the twins then reveal who they were blackmailing and explain the whole deal with Ludo Bagman, how he cheated them out of the bet they made with him at the Quidditch World Cup and wouldn't give them their money back, and how he made a bet on Harry to win the Triwizard Tournament to pay the goblins back the money they owed him. 
Turns out, however, since Harry tied with Cedric, the goblins don't consider that a win, so Bagman went on the run. The one moment from this part I would have liked to have seen them fit in somewhere happens after they arrive at King's Cross Station. Harry gives Fred and George his winnings from the Triwizard Tournament so they can start their joke shop. He says they're all going to need a good laugh soon enough, and his only condition is that they also buy Ron a new pair of dress robes. Oh, and that they don't tell their mom he gave it to them. So after getting off the train, Harry says goodbye to everyone and goes home with the Dursleys. And that's the end. Yeah, this movie overall is good, but it's basically a Cliff Notes version of the book that removes a lot of mystery, context, and character development, some of which do make sense to cut, while others definitely weaken the story. And given the length of these later books, this is a trend that will continue with the adaptations, though some overcome this better than others, such as the next installment, Order of the Phoenix.